Hey friends, thanks for checking out the Awaken Church YouTube channel. We hope that the ministry of Awaken Church is a blessing to you. We have two goals for the sermon today. Number one, we want you to know the gospel of Jesus Christ. Number two, we want you to grow closer in your walk with Him. And so we're so excited that you are taking the time to jump into our message. If you're blessed by the ministry, we'd love to ask you to give online. You can go to myawaken.org and click on give and invest into the ministry. And we believe God's going to bless you for that. We can't wait to share the word with you today. So jump right in. Pray you're blessed by the ministry. God bless you. We're going back to John chapter 6 today. We've been in a series called Summer Mixtape, and basically that just means we're in a series that isn't a series because uh, we had, we're going to have some different guests throughout uh, the, the, the month of July, and, and so I'm, I'm excited about that. Last week, my friend Pastor Chino, for, I, I won't even try to say his last name because I can't say it, but Pastor Chino was with us from Greater Church in Ackworth and just preached a phenomenal message. Can we give it up for Pastor Chino? What an amazing job he did. And uh, filled in for me as I was recovering from, uh, from wisdom tooth extraction. Really fun experience. If you've never had it done, I highly recommend it. It's a, it's a blast. Um, by the way, I told First Service this, that I am, I'm, pretty, I'm like 80% recovered. I'm eating some solid food now, but like swelling is not all the way gone in some areas. And I feel parts of my mouth that I'm not used to feeling. And so if I preach and I sound a little weird at any point, just know that's why. Also, if, if I spit more, that's why. So to the front row, welcome to the splash zone. Like, I hope you, uh, I, I, maybe it's anointed. I don't know. We'll see. It'll heal your ailments, whatever. Um, but we're going back to John chapter 6 today. And uh, I am, I'm really excited about this word. I told you a couple weeks ago that God was kind of dealing with me, at least for a season. I don't know if this is a month, two months, a year, whatever, that, that this is the style that I'm going to take to preaching. And then I'm not necessarily preparing messages. I have, I have an outline of things that I've looked at, but I'm not necessarily preaching a message to you as much as I'm inviting you into the way that I study Scripture and the parallels that I try to make and stuff like that. And so that's what we're doing today in John chapter 6. A couple weeks ago, we talked about the first few verses of this chapter where Jesus is escaping the crowd because he's discovered that John has passed away. He's going off by himself, brings the disciples with him, and they're going to have a little vacation because even Jesus needed a vacation every now and again. Everybody else say, amen, we have biblical precedent that I need to be getting away to the beach for a week or two every now and again. Like Jesus set a precedent for vacation, but as he's going on vacation, the crowd continues to follow him because Scripture says they saw the miracles that he did. And so Jesus finally sits down and just lets the crowd get to him. And scripture says that he looks at Philip and he says, hey, where are we going to get bread for them? Philip says we can't afford it. Andrew said there's a boy here with two loaves and, or uh, two fish, five, two loaves, five fish. I don't know. I always get that wrong. You can read it in the Bible. It's there. He, get, he said, we got this food. It's not much. It's a lunchable. And he says, but what's that with such a big crowd? Jesus takes it, blesses it, multiplies it, feeds everybody. And last time, what we talked about was the fact that if we bring God a maybe, God can do miracles with our maybes. We don't got to understand what God's going to do. We just got to be willing to say, Lord, here's what little I have to offer, and God will take it and do some amazing things. So we're going to pick up in verse number 14 today. We're going to read through verse 27 for those of you that like to take notes. By the way, I still encourage you, if you've got a physical Bible, like highlight, take notes. If you're taking notes, like write some stuff down because you can go back to it throughout the week. So we're going through verse 27 today if you're someone that likes to take notes. So let's begin reading verse number 14. Uh, when the people saw him do this miraculous sign, remember, they're following Jesus based on the many miracles that they've seen him do. But when they see him do this one, like they had seen him touch blind eyes, they had seen him touch lame legs, they had seen him do some stuff. But when they saw him feed 20,000 people with just a little bit of food, when they saw him do this miraculous sign, look what they said. They said, surely he is the prophet we have been expecting. I want you to say that with me. Say, prophet, we've been expecting. He's the prophet we've been expecting. They say, look, we, we have seen Jesus do some stuff, but when he starts making bread meet needs where there's not enough bread to meet needs, they start pulling back the, in, in, in their Rolodex of their mind. They start remembering something. You see, there's been another person in the narrative of Scripture that made bread where there was no bread. There's been another person in the narrative of Scripture that made sure there was food when there wasn't capacity to have food. His name was Moses, and he had made manna from heaven. Moses had obeyed the Lord, and God had been able to provide for the nation of Israel. And so now as they see Jesus multiplying the bread, multiplying the fish, they say, oh my goodness, 
This is the prophet. When they say this is the prophet in their culture, in Jewish tradition, they believe this is Moses 2.0. Like Moses is back. In fact, if you read in the book of Hebrews, the entire book of Hebrews, by the way, is a message to Jews that is saying Jesus is better than everything you want to try to think is superlative. Hebrews says Jesus is better than, than the law. Hebrews says Jesus is better than Moses. Jesus is better than angels. So when they first see Jesus doing miracles, they think this is Moses. In other words, They thought Jesus was a type of Moses, not understanding that, in fact, Moses was a type of Jesus. Moses was a picture. You need to understand, if you read the Old Testament, everything that happens from Genesis all the way through Zechariah, Genesis all the way through Malachi, is a picture that is leading us to the manifestation. The Scripture says, when the fullness of time had come, that the Son of God was made manifest. Everything in the Old Testament is pointing to Jesus. And so Jesus was not a type of anybody. Everybody else was a type or a picture of Jesus. They see Jesus and they think, oh, this is Moses. And then they said, he's going to show up how we expected him to. In other words, they let their preconceived idea and their understanding of what had happened in the past build a little box and a template within which they thought God could move. Because when the Son of God, when when the miraculous man shows up, the only context they had was he's going to look like Moses. He's going to be like the prophet. He's going to be like Moses was providing for us in the wilderness. And the problem is that sometimes God shows up in our life, and I wonder if maybe I'm the only saint in the house of God that will be honest enough to say that I present my little box within which I think he can move. He shows up and he says, I got a powerful work that I want to do in your life. I got some miracles I want to perform. And I say, all right, here is the template within which you can do that, Lord. It's the prophet that can move in the way that I am expecting. We present God our box. We present God our template. And we think that he's going to move in a miraculous way within a context that we provide for him. The problem is that our boxes are not big enough for the God that we serve. Jesus was not willing to simply be thought of as the prophet that can provide bread when he was supposed to be the bread of life. He was not satisfied to be the prophet that can provide bread when he was supposed to be the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And so look at Jesus' response when they say, oh my goodness, this is the prophet. This is the one. This is the guy that's going to be the everything we're looking for. He's going to provide bread for us just like Moses did. Look at Jesus' response. When Jesus saw that they were ready to force him to be their king, he slipped away into the hills by himself. Now, I'm I'm a pastor, and so much of what we do and much of what I do and preach and most of the ministries that we have is us trying to convince you to make Jesus the king of your life. Like, usually making Jesus king is a good thing. Usually that's a desirable outcome. But in this situation, they want to make Jesus king, and Jesus says, I'm not about it. Jesus escapes into the hills because they're about to make him the king. This is so crazy to me because you remember last week we talked about the fact that Jesus was driven by purpose. Jesus' purpose is what was driving him in this moment. He remembers it's Passover. He remembers he has to go to the cross. He knows he has to pay the price for sin. And so when Jesus, he, he gives us this picture that when you fully understand your purpose, you understand that promotion is not always desirable. When you understand your purpose, you see that some promotions can actually be a trick of the enemy. Some promotions can actually be a snare that would keep you from walking the path that you're supposed to walk. I, I, was, I had a friend that was a pastor, and he, he, used, he, he knew all the old sayings that all the old church used to say. And I know a lot of them. But he, knew all, he, said, he said he had a pastor one time that said that, I've been called to be a preacher, and I wouldn't stoop to be a king. When you understand purpose, you understand that promotion is not always a benefit. When you know what you're called to do, Jesus said, I am called to give my life for mankind. And so to be made a king would be subpar to my purpose. And so rather than letting a group of people that are enamored with the miracles put a crown on his head, he runs into the hills. Because if he gets crowned king, you got to think about this. Like, when you read this, let's keep everything in context. Jesus is just a a couple of years at most at this point from giving his life on Calvary. If he's made a king in this moment, he has a revolution that's about to take place when he gets arrested and crucified. He wasn't ready to be made king because before he was ready to rule, he had to suffer. 
Jesus shows us that if you let your promotion happen too early, if you let yourself get elevated before it's time for you to be elevated, what you're actually doing is sabotaging the ultimate purpose that God has for your life. The way that I wrote it down is this. I said that when you experience premature promotion, it actually creates a parameter for your potential. There, there's walls that are put on how big you can grow, how far you can reach, how much you can do when you try to climb the ladder too fast. That's why scripture gives us this paradoxical nature that we're supposed to walk in when it says that we are to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God so that he may exalt us in due time. In other words, that scripture says if you want to go higher, the key is to go lower. If you want to be elevated in the kingdom of God, serve more. If you want to be elevated in the kingdom of God, think less of yourself. Scripture said, I must decrease so that he must increase. The way to go up is to go down. It makes no sense, but Jesus models this for us. They're about to make him king, and he says, I got to get away from all this. Because I've not been called to be a king right now. I've been called to be a lamb. And for me to experience premature promotion would create a parameter on my potential. By the way, in this passage... Of verses 14 through 27, we see three different differentiations of people and three different locations. The first one is we see Jesus in the hills. If you're taking notes, the first one is Jesus in the hills. He goes to the hills. The second people group and location that we see is we see the disciples in a boat. All right, so let's read about that. Verse number 16. That evening, Jesus, went down, Jesus' disciples went down to the shore to wait for him. But as darkness fell... And Jesus still hadn't come back. Can you hear the annoyance in John's writing as he's remembering this? He's writing it down, and he's saying, yeah, I remember me and the boys, we were hanging out, we went and we went on the shore, and then darkness fell, and Jesus still hadn't come back. Like, he's, he's frustrated. Jesus is taking too long. The interesting thing to me is the disciples are cool with waiting on the shore as long as the sun's out. The disciples are cool. Uh, listen, if you've not experienced this, this unbelievable spiritual experience of waiting on the Lord, it's a blessing. It is a blessing in your life. When you go to God and you say, Lord, I need a yes or a no, and he says, well, how about a wait? What a blessing. What a blessing when the Lord says, wait on me. And, and in fact, a lot of times, it is honestly, it's, it's an act of surrender. And there's something beautiful when you surrender to the Lord and you wait on him. And waiting on the Lord is really cute for the first five minutes. And then you start to think, well, Lord, can you, can you like give me a time frame of how long to wait? And he says, well, let me give you one. To the Lord, a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day. And you say, all right, Lord, thank you so much for that clarity. Appreciate the clarification of the word of the Lord. The disciples are willing to wait as long as the sun is out. As long as I can just kind of sunbathe and I can chill by the beach and I got my cooler and I got my fan and they probably had a nice umbrella and a tent. They were probably just having a good beach day. But then the sun went down. And when the sun went down, when darkness fell, the disciples are like, how long is this going to take? We've been here for hours. We've been waiting here for a long time. Jesus is in the hills. I don't know where he's coming. Not to mention, let's remember the context. John has died. Jesus is weary. He's on vacation. The disciples probably had a thought of like, so are we done? Like, is this it? Are we, are we still doing this whole disciple, rabbi, traveling the world, doing miracles? Are we still doing all that? Like, there's so much uncertainty going on in the life of disciples at this moment that when darkness falls, can I tell you what that word term, darkness falls? What, to me, what it pictured is it's a circumstantial change. And a lot of us are really willing to wait on the Lord as long as circumstances are conducive to waiting. You ever had the Lord tell you it's time for a vocation change? It's time for you to give more? It's time for you to whatever. Like it's this extravagant moment and you're like, all right, cool, because I got six months of savings in the bank and so we're going to be good. And so I will wait on you, Lord. And then you experience the transition of savings turning to spendings. Anybody else ever been there that your savings account was your spendings account? And then all of a sudden waiting is really cool when you got, you got some margin. But the margin gets tighter and tighter and tighter. And waiting gets scarier and scarier and scarier. Circumstances change, 
And so the disciples, after darkness falls, they get tired of waiting on Jesus. They don't know when he's coming back out of the hills. They don't know what their next step is. And so look at what they do. It says that when darkness fell, as Jesus hadn't come back, they got into a boat and headed across the lake toward Capernaum. Now, why is that significant? Capernaum was the home base for Jesus and his ministry. Capernaum was where the disciples spent the majority of their time up to this point in the ministry. Capernaum was where they knew where the local coffee shop was. They knew where everything, they they were comfortable in Capernaum. They knew how the Walmart was laid out at Capernaum. Because how many of y'all know, you go to a different Walmart, it's laid out different than the other. They, They knew Capernaum. And so when they got caught in uncertainty, when they got caught in circumstances shifting, what they did was they retreated back into what was comfortable. And a lot of times we're really willing to follow Jesus and wait on Jesus, and then our circumstances change, and we stop worshiping the God that is Jesus, and we start worshiping the God that is comfort. And so I take a job, not necessarily because the Lord told me to, but because it's, it's going to make me more comfortable. I, I'm going to I'm go to a church to where they don't expect as much out of me, not because God told me to, because it's more comfortable. It's quiet in here on Father's Day this morning. We, we retreat into comfort. They sail back to Capernaum because I don't know how long I'm going to have to wait on the shore, and I'd rather go to Capernaum where it's safe and I know what's happening. The problem is, is we misinterpret the purpose of our waiting seasons. We think that God has us waiting because he's trying to develop something in us. But when they sailed towards Capernaum, they figured out God didn't have them waiting because he was trying to get them to prove something. He had them waiting because he was trying to protect them from something. He had them waiting because he understood what was on the other side of their shortchanging their waiting season. So they get in a boat. Let's see what happens. They get into a boat, sailed across the lake of Capernaum. Soon a gale swept. Y'all know what a gale is. Obviously, you all know what a gale is. A gale is, is the Greek word animus, which just means a mega storm. They thought Jesus had them waiting because Jesus is just this funny little sense of humor guy that wants them waiting on the beach with no idea what's coming. Jesus had them waiting because he knew in the middle of that sea was a storm that had the capacity to kill them. And so he said, I would rather let you sit in uncertainty than risk your life by sailing into what's comfortable. I would rather let you stay in the dark wondering what's happening than be in the middle of the sea when the storm of your life, the mega storm, shows up and begins to shake everything that you're called to do and begins to hinder your purpose. And some of us, maybe I'm the only one that has decided, God, you're taking too long. I'm going to take it in my hands. I'm going to do things my way. And then I got in the middle of my way and found a storm that rocked my life. Anybody else ever decided they were going to do things their way and then found out that their way really was not all that beneficial. They sail into the middle of the sea of Capernaum. They get hit by a gale. A mega storm hits them. And it says the sea grew very rough. This is interesting. They have rowed three or four miles. A lot of scholars, commentaries say that this particular body of water would have, would have been six miles wide. So they've gone about halfway. They hit the sea halfway through. And Jesus had every right, like if it was me, just based on my parenting and the way that I, you know, listen, it's Father's Day, so we're going to be real for a minute. How many of y'all ever told your kids, stop jumping on that, stop jumping on that, stop jumping on that, and then they fall and get hurt? I ain't about to, like, say, are you okay? I told you to stop jumping three times. Like, unless you broke your neck and we need emergent medical services right now, like, I'm going to say, I told you to stop jumping. My wife is all trying to make sure they're, like, alive, and I'm like, I told them to stop jumping. If I'm Jesus and the disciples get in the middle of this mega storm, I'm saying, I told y'all to wait on the shore. Andrew, did I not say? Like, you know how we do. Did you hear me? I was very plain. Wait. And they sailed across anyway. But Jesus didn't like that. They get in the middle of a mega storm, in the middle of a trial that they are in because of their own impatience. And rather than Jesus saying, you know what, it's your fault, he comes to them in the middle of their storm. He comes to them in the middle of the gale. 
he shows up. Look what the scripture says. They're in the middle of it. They had rowed three to four miles when suddenly they saw Jesus walking on the water toward the boat. Which, by the way, I can't even walk on water when it's still. But I for sure can't walk on no water in the middle of a mega storm. But Jesus, storms don't affect his capacity to perform miracles. Winds don't affect his capacity to show up to you. It don't matter how the waves are beating against you. He can still walk on the water. He can surf with the best of them. Jesus can walk on any wave, any wind, and show up in the middle of your storm. He shows up to them. Now, let me break away from this text for just a moment to go to the book of Titus, chapter 2, verse number 13. When Paul is writing this letter to Titus, as he's telling about Jesus, this is what Paul says. Titus, chapter 2, verse 13. Go to that verse. I don't have it here. While we look forward with hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our Great God and Savior Jesus. That word great is animus. It's the same Greek word. This storm was a mega storm, but a mega God showed up in a mega storm. And he provided the relief that they need. Some of y'all think your storm is so much bigger than anything anybody could understand. And you're, you're like, I got myself into this situation, but I'm still in a mega storm. I'm the one that made the decision that got me here, but I'm still in a situation I don't know how I'm going to get out of. Can I tell you that there is a mega God that's ready to meet you in your mega storm and provide relief to you regardless of what decisions you've made to bring you to this point. Jesus shows up walking on water. Here comes the mega God in the middle of the mega storm, walking on the water, ready to be the one. And and we know we have context now that Jesus can calm the wind and the waves. He has the capacity to do that. But the disciples don't ask him to do that. The disciples, look at what it says. It said, Jesus, they saw him walking to them. They were scared. They were terrified is what scripture says. Uh, My my page is, the, the air conditioner turned my page. So excuse me for that break in the sermon. All right. They said that they, they saw him walking on the waves. Let's see here. He called out to them when they were terrified and said, don't be afraid. I am here. By the way, one of the most common phrases that Jesus gives to the disciples throughout their ministry is don't be afraid. Jesus loves to whisper those words to his children in the midst of an uncertain economy, in the midst of political climates that are just absolutely crazy, in the midst of you not knowing where you're going to get your next job and what's going to, can I just tell you the words of Jesus are still applicable to you? Don't be afraid. I am here. No matter what you're going through today, don't be afraid because he's here. He said, don't be afraid. I'm here. And this is the part that I want to tell you about. Then they were eager to let him in the boat. This hit me because... We're going to talk about the third location in just a minute, which is the crowd on the shore. And they just want more miracles. They want more food. They want to keep doing it. They're following him for the miracles. The disciples don't ask for more miracles. In fact, they ask him to stop the miracle he's doing short. He's walking on the water. And they say, would you get in the boat? See, To me, what this ministered to me is that there are some seasons that you go through storms, and when you go through storms to a certain degree, you become less enamored with the power of God and more hungry for the proximity of God. I'd rather you be close than you perform a miracle. Like, I'm thankful that he can heal the sick. But I'm also, th- also thankful that in the middle of the night when nobody else is around and I'm feeling lonely and I'm feeling depressed and I'm feeling worried that I can whisper the name Jesus and I got proximity. I'm thankful for power, but I'm so thankful for proximity. He's a God that is closer than any brother. He's a God that at the mention of his name, he shows up. He said it was a very present help in time of trouble. I'm thankful for his power, but the disciples understood as good as your power is, give me proximity any day over power because if I know you're in the boat, I'll ride through any storm. I'll ride through any way. Wave. I don't even need you to tell it to be still because if you're in the boat, proximity is a great substitution for power. Some of us need to say, God, would you just be close? And it seems like they're sacrificing something when they are eager to get him in the boat, but really the disciples reveal a cheat code to us because they choose proximity over power, and look at what happened. They were eager to let him in the boat. Remember, they're three miles into a six-mile journey. He gets in the boat, and immediately they arrived at their destination. I don't got any sci-fi fans up in the room today. They are transported more than two miles in an instant. Jesus shows us something here. He shows us that when you become more concerned with proximity than you are power, there are seasons 
that it lets you simulate process. When you're more concerned with being close than you are being influential, he says, all right, let's jump a couple steps to the ladder. You arrive at your destination quicker, not because you deserve to be there, but just because you chose closeness with the God who could get you there, as opposed to saying, God, would you get me to my destination? You said, get in the boat. And when he gets in the boat, they show up at the destination. I'm telling you, in a world that tells us promotion is all we need to seek after, in a world that tells us that we need to know how to climb the ladder and we need to know how to get more and do, I'm telling you, if you will choose closeness, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things shall be added unto you. Stop seeking wealth. Stop seeking promotion. Start seeking him and I promise you, when you get proximity, you're going to bypass some process and find yourself at the destination because that's how the kingdom is structured. Immediately they arrived at their destination. So the first location is Jesus in the hills. Second location, the disciples in the boat. And the third one is the people in the shore. Now the first two were fun preaching. This is where it turns around and it gets a little convicting, all right? So let's go to John chapter 6, verse number 22. The next day, the crowd had stayed on the far shore, saw that the disciples had taken the only boat, no boats, Boat's gone. They're just on the shore. This is an important phrase. And they realized Jesus had not gone with them. They knew Jesus wasn't with the disciples. Okay? That's an important little piece of this puzzle. They knew Jesus was not with the disciples. Let's see. Taking the only boat, realized Jesus wasn't, had gone, not gone with him. Several boats from Tiberias. By the way, I, I think we read the Bible a little too seriously sometimes because I'm reading this. And I'm just, I'm seeing these people wake up from sleeping all night. And they're like, we got here. But now they're stuck on this side of the sea without a boat. They don't know how they're getting home. Jesus ain't here. The disciples aren't here. And so they're like, where's everybody at? And then this, this randomly, had, several boats from Tiberias landed near that place where the Lord had blessed the bread. So stay with me. Like, again, practical thinking here. They're sitting on the shore, don't have a boat. Several boats from Tiberias show up. They steal these boats. These are not their boats. Some random person from Tiberias came back from their little journey on the aisle and said, I could have swore I parked right here. They steal their boats. And again, they know Jesus isn't with the disciples. They didn't go looking for Jesus. I would submit to you they didn't even go looking for the disciples. I think the reason why it mentions to us that they saw the only boat wasn't there is because they remembered on that boat, they put 12 baskets of food. And so they weren't chasing Jesus, and they weren't chasing the disciples. They were chasing some bread. They were hungry. And they said, I'm going to steal a boat to go get some stale bread. Because when all you're concerned about is the miracle. When all you're concerned about is the provision, you'll start using means that don't even belong to you to go and try get it. You'll start using stuff that was never intended for you to use to go get some bread that is not intended to feed you today. That bread was for yesterday. That miracle was for yesterday. And they're using boats that don't belong to them to go and try get a meal that is already expired. And I don't know, on Father's Day... We can talk about, I told you the disciples chose proximity over power, but this crowd chose provision over proximity. They chose to leave Jesus in the hills to go sailing across the sea to find some bread. And fathers, can I just can I just tell you on Father's Day? Don't let provision become a substitute for proximity. Don't let needing to make the next dollar, needing to make the next thing, don't let that become something that you sacrifice your walk with Jesus over. Don't let it be that I'm so worried about making money that I never spend time in the Word. I'm so worried about providing for my family that I never model prayer and Scripture to my children, that I never invest in them. There's multi-layers to this. It's not just proximity to God, but also proximity to your family. Don't become so concerned with provision that your kids don't even know you. 
Like there's a lot of families across our nation in, in the prosperity that we experience in America that there are fathers that spend hour after hour, day after day, weekend after weekend, that they are working and working and working and they're providing, they're putting meals on the table, but their kids don't know them. And I promise you, when your kid gets older, they're not going to tell about the time that their dad bought them a PS5 when they were seven. They're not going to tell about the time that their dad paid for them to go on vacation when they were 10. What they are going to tell, and the stories that we end up telling are, I remember every single night at 5 o'clock, no matter what, my dad would come in the door, and he would sit down, and he would have dinner with me. Because your presence is far more valuable to them than any provision that you can provide. I'm not telling you that, so you'll say, well, Pastor Tyler told me not to work, so uh, I'm turning in my notice tomorrow. We're going to live by faith, baby. Like, that's not... That's not this message. That's not what Scripture calls us to. Scripture tells us that a man who doesn't provide for his family is worse than an infidel. Like, what, can, can I just, I got on a soapbox in first service. Y'all know, I, even when I'm teaching, I get on it. There, there's this whole term going around toxic masculinity. And I'm going to tell you something. There are, obviously, I know there are extreme cases, but I, can I tell you that concept, that mindset is born out of hell? Because it is meant to demasculate men to where men won't lead their families in godliness and righteousness. Men won't stand up and fight for their families and protect their families. I'm going to tell you something. The way God structured this thing is that before anything spiritual gets into my house, it's got to go through me. Men, you got to start standing up and fighting for your families. Stop, le stop, lepping, stop letting the mother of your children be their spiritual covering, being the only one that's praying for them, being the only one that's declaring blessing over them. Men, it's time for some fathers to stand up and declare, my children will be men and women of God. They will be men and women of integrity. I'm thankful I had a mom that prayed for me, but I had a dad that required things of me. Men, you got to ask some stuff of your children. Men, you got, you got to expect some stuff of your children. Stop letting them get away with just whatever they want to do. I'm, and listen, I'm not standing up here as a perfect father. I got so many things that I need to do. But I tell you something, I expect some stuff out of my kids. And I let them know when they don't meet my expectations. And I still believe in godly discipline. Can I get an amen from anybody in this room? There's all kinds of stuff right now about raising children and submission and all that stuff. And don't get me wrong, the... The thing about it is there's, there's a whole movement right now that has been kind of outed of, of submission, and, and it was unhealthy. The thing about requiring submission of a wife and children is that there's another half, half of that verse. It says, women, submit yourself to your husband. But it also says, husbands, give yourself for your wife as Christ did for the church. Unless you are willing to give yourself and everything you have and sacrifice for your family, then you can't use that scripture to say, submit to me. See, the, the submission is juxtaposed with the willingness of the man to honor his wife and his children. If you don't honor them, they will not submit to you. But wives, if you don't submit, he's not going to honor. It's a, I don't even know what I'm talking This is not in the verse today. All right, go back to the scripture. John chapter 6. The next day, the crowd had stayed far shore, saw so realized Jesus went several boats from Tiberias, landed near the place where the Lord had blessed the bread people had eaten. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were in them, they got in the boats. They steal the boats. This is Grand Theft, not auto, Grand Theft Kayak, I guess. I don't know. They got into the boats and went across to Capernaum to look for him. Now, John says this again. They knew Jesus. Was, they were not looking for Jesus. He was in the hills. I'm going to talk to John when I get to heaven about that particular passage there. They found him on the other side of the lake. And this is how I know they weren't looking for Jesus. Because when they get there and they see Jesus, they say, Rabbi, when would you get here? How many of y'all know you ain't never surprised to find what you're looking for? If, if I show up, if we show up to the same place and you say, well, I didn't know you were going to be here. Guess what is evident to me? You did not come there to see me. Because if you came to see me, you're not going to say, I did not expect for you to be there. I don't care how much of a person of faith you are. They show up, Rabbi, when did you get, I didn't know you was going to be here, Jesus. But since you're here, what's for dinner? I mean, since you're here, let's go ahead and have some food. And Jesus shows us that they weren't looking for him in this next verse. He says, I'll tell you the truth. This is going to hit somebody because it hit me. I'll tell you the truth. You want to be with me because I fed you. 
The only reason you want to be with me is because you were a beneficiary of the last miracle. That's the only reason you're here. The only reason you're here is because you want another meal. Because I fed you. This is the phrase. Not because you understood the miraculous signs. Miracles are always supposed to be signs. The gifts of the Spirit are always supposed to be signs. And I'm going to tell you where, where Pentecostal charismatic church, where we've made a mistake for generations and decades and whatever, like however long you want to say, is that we have treated the signs as though they were the destination. Can I tell you this? Signs are not settlements. You're not supposed to stay at a sign. The way that I told this in first service was, uh, a couple months ago, Kayla and I went to do a, a church planner training in New Orleans, and we, we drove through Atlanta, and Atlanta traffic is just a blessing. Like, it's just, I'm grateful for it. I love it. I never, never try to avoid it at all. But we got off on the, on the interstate, going towards the airport, and you see the exit there. It says international, domestic, all that. I'm going there. I, I'm flying to New Orleans. I want you to imagine with me, I get off right there. I see that sign. I pull over to the shoulder of the road, right, shoulder of the road, right under the exit sign that says international domestic. I just put my car in park and I sit there and I think, I wonder how long till we get to New Orleans. I'd still be sitting there because a sign is supposed to point you to something. It's not a destination. And many of us are going to signs and thinking, man, we have arrived. We got there. The gifts of the Spirit are in operation. We got there. I spoke in tongues. I got there. Healing happened. I got there. It's a sign. It's supposed to point to something. Everything, every miracle, every gift of the Spirit is intended to point to Jesus. John chapter 14 tells us that the Spirit's entire purpose is to lead us into all truth, to remind us of what Jesus has said. Everything the Holy Spirit does is pointing to, reminding of, and testifying about Jesus. This becomes a great filter for a spirit-filled church. When stuff starts happening, the Holy Spirit starts moving, a great filter to decide, is this actually the Spirit or is this just people? Because can I tell you something? I've been raised, I was telling somebody the other day, I was raised in, in Pentecostal churches that were awesome and like I value my heritage, love my heritage, but we, we fellowshiped with some churches that were just, I don't know any other way to say it, than they were just straight up crazy. Like they were crazy. Uh, there was one lady that was always getting a fresh word from the Lord about we were supposed to stand in wash tubs with one of our socks off and all that. Like, it was just, it's crazy. Anyways, the, the reason that I tell you that is because charismatics and Pentecostals have gotten a bad name because there's weird folks that do weird things and say it was the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit ain't weird. People are weird. So if you see someone doing something weird, and they say it's the Holy Spirit, just know he's pretty cool. They're still in process. Like, just, just have some patience, have some grace, because there's some weird stuff that happens. But a great filter to put it through is to say, is this pointing to Jesus? When someone is healed, it's a testimony of the fact that by his stripes, it points to Jesus. The reason why Paul said, he gives some parameters. He said, look, you're going to speak in tongues? Give an interpretation. Because in public, if there's just a whole bunch of people speaking in tongues and somebody comes in, they're going to say, I don't know what's happening right here. That's why he said more earnestly desire prophecy because prophecy can testify of Jesus. Speaking in tongues with interpretation can testify of Jesus. Do we still speak in tongues even when we don't have an interpreter? That's called praying in tongues. It's a whole separate thing. And there are moments that you, you yield to the gift. I, I'm not teaching on the Holy Spirit today. We're going to do this. In, a, in fact, I'm really excited when, I, when we get back through this series of Summer Mixtape. We're starting a series in the month of August called This Is Not That. And it's based on in the book of Acts where Peter said, this is that that was prophesied by the prophet Joel. We're going to talk about some of the things that have gotten the guise of the Holy Spirit that are actually not the Holy Spirit. And we need to be careful of that so that we can walk into the fullness of who he is. But whenever we do pray in tongues or we speak in tongues, there are moments, there are times that I've been in settings that a person got a message in tongues, gave the message in tongues, and they yielded in obedience, but nobody yielded in obedience to the interpretation. That's not on the person that gave the message in tongues. That's on the person that didn't yield to the interpretation. And so that's the beautiful thing about the way the Holy Spirit works is he wants us walking in a corporate communication, a corporate partnership 
to see his will come to pass on the earth, but all of it should point to Jesus. Every gift, every miracle should point to Jesus. He said, you misunderstood the miraculous signs. And Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. You want to be with me because I fed you, not because you understood the miraculous signs. But don't be so concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. For God the Father has given me the seal of his approval. Jesus says, you want food, you want a miracle, you want a sign, but I got something so much better than food. I got something so much better than a sign. And listen, I get it. When you're hungry, like right now, there ain't a lot that seems better than food. When you're sick, there's not a lot that seems better than healing. When you're bound, there's not a lot that seems better than deliverance. But Jesus said, look, I'm trying to let you know, don't seek after perishable things. Because here's the thing, no matter how much healing you experience in this earth, the body that gets healed is still perishable. And so we're like, man, why don't we ever see healing? There has never been one individual that knows Jesus. No matter what the outcome of their earthly life, well, there's never been one of them that wasn't healed. Whether it's in this life or in eternity, there's healing. That's why he says, don't, see, don't be so caught up with the perishable things. Because if all we care about is the perishable things, when God doesn't provide the perishable thing, we'll lose out with him. But if you seek the eternal life, then it's that verse I quoted earlier. All of these perishable things begin being added to you. As you seek eternal life, it's crazy how healing shows up in your life. As you seek eternal life, it's crazy how deliverance shows up. As you seek eternal life, it's crazy how provision shows up when you choose proximity. You choose being close. The title of this message today is Prioritizing Proximity. More than I need his power, more than I need his provision, I need his proximity. I need to be close. And so maybe you're in this room today and you've been wondering, Jesus, why are you taking so long up in them hills? I've been waiting on you, but I can't wait much longer. And you've been thinking about jumping in the boat yourself. I'm encouraging you, just keep waiting. Just keep waiting. Or maybe you're the person that you, you jumped in the boat. You're already in the middle of the sea. And there's a mega storm that's shown up. And you're regretting your decision, but you know you for sure can't turn around and sail back. Can I tell you, he's graceful enough to show up to you in the middle of your storm. And if you'll choose proximity, I believe he's a God that's gracious enough that he can help you to bypass some of the process that your decisions should have brought in your life. And lastly, maybe you're a person that's like the crowd. You've been seeking him for the gift. You've been seeking him for the miracle. And he's saying, stop seeking perishable things. Seek eternal life. Seek me. Find proximity. I want you to stand with me today. Hey, friends, I hope you were blessed by the message today. Listen, if you've decided to accept Jesus today, I just want to tell you what an amazing decision you've made. It's quite literally the best decision that you could have ever made. And so I want to lead you in a prayer. And listen, there's nothing magical about these words. There's nothing that I'm going to say that is, is really spectacular in nature. But if you posture in your heart to where you say, God, I need you, and I want you in my life, then this prayer that I'm about to pray can literally change your life. And I believe God is about to move into your situation and change your life for the better. And I believe you're about to secure your eternity in heaven. So would you pray this prayer with me? Say, Father, I believe that Jesus is who he says he is. I believe he's the son of God. I believe he died on the cross for my sin. And I'm sorry for the way that I've been living my life, but today I hear you calling me into relationship. So Jesus, would you forgive me? Would you cleanse me? Would you make me new? Would you be the Lord of my life? And I promise that by your grace, I'm going to live the rest of my life for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Listen, friend, if you just prayed that prayer, can I tell you, it is the best moment 
of your life. You just secured your eternity in heaven. Now you're on a journey. It doesn't stop there. It's not a prayer you pray and you're done, but now you're on a journey called discipleship as you grow to learn of Jesus and grow to learn more of him. And we would love to be a part of that journey. If you got saved today, would you please send us an email to info at myawaken.org? And in that subject line, just put, I receive Jesus. And we would love to follow up with you and tell you what your next steps are in that discipleship process. Thank you again for watching us. We can't wait to see you again right here next week. God bless you. Have a good week.